Thank you, Mike, for that uh, wonderful introduction. And uh, thank you to Data Carpentries for inviting me to provide this workshop. Um, my name is Amit Doshi. I'm a librarian at Princeton University in New Jersey, in the USA. Um, I work at Stokes Library, which is dedicated to the School of Public and International Affairs, as well as sociology and population research. Um, thanks everyone for taking the time to enroll in today's session. And uh, this is gonna be an interactive workshop. So we'll be working with rstudio.cloud and I'll provide some guidance on how to set up an account shortly. Um, and we're gonna learn the basics of working with a data set using the R programming language, but we're also gonna be using R to analyze the concept of intersectionality. So before we begin with learning R, I thought it would be helpful to provide a definition of the concept of intersectionality, uh, acknowledging that several of you may already have a uh, background in this uh, emerging world of uh, emerging domain within so sociology and population research. But this term of intersectionality was first theorized by the black feminist scholar, Kimberly Williams Crenshaw in 1989. Uh, we don't have a, uh, you know, enough time to do a deep dive into the concept. Uh, there are entire courses taught on uh, intersectionality, but very broadly speaking, intersectionality involves analyzing the intersection between race and gender. That was the initial uh, kind of thrust of this research, but that concept and this domain of research has really broadened since Crenshaw's initial um, work on race and gender. Uh, so now it includes socioeconomic class. It may include um, uh, language. There are a variety of individual characteristics that could now fall under the, the concept of intersectionality. Um, and in order to learn the basic functionality of R, using this context of intersectionality, we're going to reproduce the results of a foundational work from labor economics. This is uh, Bertrand and Molai Nithen's field experiment. It was published in the American Economic Review in 2004 to assess the effect of racial discrimination within the labor market. At that time, there was some debate in the literature about the, uh, the, the reasons behind um, racial gaps in the uh, labor market. For example, some scholars believe that the disparities in unemployment could be attributed to factors such as uh, gaps in educational attain attainment. But to answer this question, uh, Bertrand and Molly Nathan, they conducted a field experiment. Um, they deployed thousands of resumes in multiple cities, uh, changing only the names on the resumes, the first names on the resumes. Uh, half the resumes had African American sounding names and the other half white sounding names. And I, I do wanna be careful to point out that the researchers developed this naming convention based on matching first names with race from birth records. So they took an empirical approach in developing those names. Um, but before we begin, I do wanna just uh, uh, really open the floor uh, because I imagine that several of you have grounding in this area, in this domain of intersectionality. Uh, any comments before we we start um, learning R? Or any thoughts about intersectionality, or perhaps this is an opportunity to share any work that you've done uh, about the concept of intersectionality. Hello, I had a, um, something that I wanted to share. I'm Talisha. Um, I am uh, calling in from Michigan in the U.S. And I um, recently actually learned about intersectionality in the last, I think, three years or so. Um, and what I found most interesting um, about learning about intersectionality and that concept of uh, was sort of 
thinking about all of the different ways that that make us each unique um, and, and just sort of like thinking about all those various intersections between, you know, someone I may speak a common language with or someone I may have a kind of experience with, you know, even taking it as far as experiences and background and um, upbringing or religion or anything um, is just a really interesting concept to think about all of the different ways that we intersect with each other and all of the different ways that we're different um, from each other. Um, and I'm interested in uh, learning about how to use R to, to sort of uh, look at that data. Thank you, Talisha. That's a wonderful comment. And um, I'll just add that uh, the work that we're going to do today really is just a very um, skims the surface of a very deep ocean. Uh, and I, I want to emphasize that because there's a lot more work that needs to be done at this intersection between intersectionality and, uh, and learning R. Um, you know, R is free open source programming languages, it's it's really a very democratic tool in my view. Uh, and it lends itself well to studying social problems um, because there's a degree of access to R through tools like rstudio.cloud that make it kind of very amenable to um, a wide spectrum of learners. You know, you, you don't necessarily have to um, have high performance computing machine uh, because you can use again the cloud to to use R. Uh, there's certainly a, a learning curve required for R, uh, but there are a lot of um, communities within R that I think are advancing the democratization of coding, which I find very inspiring uh, with the goal of revealing some of these unique characteristics, you know, whether you're studying human populations or other domains. So um, I appreciate you bringing that up, uh, Talisha. And I'll, again, I'll point out that this is a rather simple field experiment, um, but there's much more work that can and should be done. So hopefully that will inspire you all to, to take this on. And, um, you know, I, this paper came out in 2004. I think it's already been uh, reproduced several times. Um, we need to advance the conversation beyond this um, this you know focus on uh, uh, revealing the problem towards solution. Uh, and I'm um, you know I'm hopeful that just by laying the groundwork. Uh, that will start to to move that direction. Um, any other comments about intersectionality or any other? Uh, would anyone else like to share their own experiences with this concept? Okay, uh, if you do have any thoughts, uh, we'll leave time at the end uh, to, to discuss that, uh, this paper, to discuss what we've learned in the R script, um, really anything related to this, um, this workshop. And the recording will be turned off uh, at that time. So, you know, an opportunity to speak really freely. Um, so on to R. Uh, we have multiple options for, for using R. I know several of you probably have R already installed on your computer, but um, for the purpose of this workshop, I'd really prefer that we use rstudio.cloud. So it's uh, very simple to set up a free account on rstudio.cloud. I'll put the link into the chat and would ask for everyone to go ahead and log into rstudio.cloud uh, just takes a moment to set up an account. And I find it to be a useful way to do this kind of instruction because the um, experience is uniform. 
So it doesn't matter which packages you've installed. It doesn't matter which version of R you have. Everyone's going to have kind of the same experience. So it's ideal for teaching in that regard. So I'll just give you a minute to go ahead and log into rstudio.cloud. And once you've done that, if you could just um, give me a thumbs up or you know some acknowledgement <laughs> in chat, that would be great. Thank you. I already see some thumbs ups. And now I'll begin sharing my screen as well. So you'll see, um, you'll see what I'll, I'll, I'll be doing in our studio class. So just give me a moment. I've got multiple screens here. So uh, there we go. Okay. You should be seeing my RStudio cloud. Um, I've got several projects going. Um, but what I'd like you to do is to, once you've logged in, you'll see a button on the top right that says new project, and then you'll have the option to create a new RStudio project. So let's go ahead and do that. We're gonna go to new project and then create a new RStudio project. And I'll type this in the chat as well. And you should see three windows up here, as well as untitled project at the top. Uh, first, we can change that untitled project to really anything you'd like. Um, I'll call mine intersectionality with R. But you can call it whatever, whatever you'd like. Fine. Um, hopefully you got my email that I sent out yesterday um, with the R script and the data file, as well as the paper that this uh, workshop is based on. Um, but if you did not, I will put the, a link into the chat where you can download those, those things. So let me do that now. So data file, R script, and the research paper. And the, really, there's no expectation that you read this. It's, it's a very long paper. Uh, but I will acknowledge that most of it uh, are figures and uh, kind of the appendix is what makes this paper so long. The actual content of the paper is only about 20 pages or so, 20, 25 pages. So not so uh, difficult reading. And again, it's a foundational work um, in, in a more experimental turn that took place in the late 90s and early 2000s within economics. Okay, uh, so you should see three windows. You've hopefully titled your workspace intersectionality with R. Uh, just a note about rstudio.cloud. Um, Again, it's a wonderful way to teach and learn using R, but there are some constraints. Uh, you can only have a certain number of projects. I think it's 15 is the limit. And you only get a certain amount of time per month, uh, you know, a certain number of hours per month. And then you're, you're starting to hit the, uh, the paid model. Uh, so just keep that in mind. I've definitely worked with studi students who love the fact that rstudio.cloud has 
you know, constantly updating their version. It's the most kind of stable version of R. The packages are updated. It's easy to install things. But then uh, they realize that they have limited RAM, they have limited hours, and uh, and then they end up reverting back to their their own machine. Um, so uh, before we really dive into the coding, I, I do want to ask you in the chat, I'd like you to uh, type a number. Uh, and the scale is, um, say, one to three. Uh, one means you, you've never used R. Uh, this is your first time. Two means that you've had some exposure to R. And three is if you are either intermediate or advanced uh, within R. So looks like most people have some exposure to R. We've got a few folks that are new. Okay, great. Thank you for the decimal points. <laughs> that, that's helpful. Uh, all right. So what I'm going to do here is uh, I want to make sure to teach this session in a way that anyone that's never used R can participate and will benefit. But I also am gonna have this meta conversation going because it seems like many of you uh, have ex exposure to R or have used R or teaching with R. And that meta conversation will be about teaching with R. So I'll point out what we're doing, but I'll also point out, this is what it feels like to teach this part of the script in a class. Uh, so hopefully that will make this valuable for, for everyone that's devoting their, uh, their morning to, to uh, participating here. Uh, so thank you for taking that time. Um, R is free open source. Um, it is one of the great kind of uh, benefits of, uh, you know, this interconnected world of research and, and data that that we're, we're in now. Um, one of the, the fun things to do in Google is you can literally Google anything and then append the phrase in R <laughs> and you'll find something, some community somewhere that is trying to do that thing, whether it's data visualization or some sort of statistical analysis. Um, there are even games in R. Uh, it's really be blossomed as a tool that's gone way beyond just statistics. The precursor to R was actually called S for statistics. It was a very niche tool used by researchers to do stats. And now it's really become um, uh, like on par with Python in terms of the, the breadth of what this tool can do. Um, there is, as with Python and other programming languages, there's a learning curve and there's jargon. And certainly some of the help files within R are a bit challenging to parse uh, and understand. Um, it takes some time, just as with learning a foreign language, you have to you know, live with it for a while. Um, but I'm confident that after today's session, you'll have the, the basics down. Uh, so we see three windows here, and I'll walk you through just briefly what each window does. Uh, this first window is the console. This is like live programming in a sense. If you type in a command in this window, you'll see some output uh, immediately appear. And the top right is the global environment. There are also other tabs here, but this is what it's most frequently used for. And that's to keep track of what you're doing. So if you say import a data set, it'll appear here in the global environment. If you name a variable, it'll appear here. So it's a great way to keep track of what you're working with. Um, sometimes students in social sciences use Stata. Uh, Stata is also a wonderful tool. Uh, it is not free, but it is very robust. There's great documentation. One of the challenges with Stata is that it's a little bit more difficult to flip between data files within Stata. You're typically using one data file at a time. With R, you can have multiple data files or quote unquote data frames going at the same time. Uh, so global environment, super helpful. We'll keep an eye on, on that window whenever we're making changes during today's script. The bottom right 
is, uh, again, has several tabs across the top here. The default tab should be under files. And this is where we upload files. Uh, you can kind of keep track of which, where your R script is, where you're, if you're uploading a, a CSV file and comma file with comma separated values, that's what CSV stands for. Um, it'll appear here. This is also where plots appear. And sometimes when you're doing a plot in R, so this could be a scatter plot, for example, or a bar graph or a histogram, uh, depending on the size of the plot, you might get an error message. And that's usually the first thing I do with students when they're getting an error message, when they try to plot something is I'll say, well, it might be the size of the window is the problem. You know, if you're kind of this small and you're trying to make a plot, you could get an error message. So now you want to make it a little bit bigger so it can accommodate the size of the plot. Uh, so this is where graphics appear. There are several other tabs here as well. And, you know, I mentioned this word packages. Uh, one of the great um, capabilities of R is that anyone can write an R package. So this is a, a routine that can do some niche um, kind of Activity action. Uh, so, if you know, there are packages to do all kinds of graphics above and beyond base R, above and beyond what comes with R. Um, so, this can again include a lot of statistical packages, but it can also include uh, things that are domain specific. So, for example, there's a very active uh, community within R that focuses just on genetics and genomics. There's a very active community within R just looking at um, climate change, uh, climate scientists that are using R because it's kind of a democratic tool, it's, it's widely used across the world. So some of these big science pro, pro, projects and programs uh, use R because they're multinational um, with you know, students involved in projects and researchers and uh, people in nonprofits. So in that sense, it is a, a robust tool where that's growing. I think now there are north of 20,000 packages available to you. Um, I found the best way to find out if there's a package to do what I need to do in R is to Google it, frankly. Uh, that's one of the, the, the easy ways to, to learn about what R is, uh, has available to you. Um, okay. so. We are seeing three windows here, but pretty soon we're going to see four. So I sent out some files to you last night. Now what I'm going to ask you to do is to use the upload button to upload the R script and the data file. You'll have to do it one at a time. And when you click on this upload button, so this is under the files tab in the bottom right window here. When you click on this upload bit button, you want to select this browse option. And you should see uh, a way to find the files that you're looking for. So just a, a navigator will appear. Uh, and we have two files. One is called resume.csv. And the other one is called carpentries. And it's carpentries august 2022 script.r. So resume.csv and then carpentries august 2022 script.r. Those are the two files that you need. And I'll just give you a moment to, to make sure that you're able to, um, to upload those two files. Resume.csv, carpentries august 2022 script.r. So now what we're going to do is we'll go ahead and click on the script file and you'll see a fourth window appear in the top left. So we'll click on the script file and now you'll see this window appear in the top left with some green text, uh, green and black text. 
Um, and while you're doing that, I also want to acknowledge uh, this script uh, comes from a wonderful book. Uh, I think one of the best, if you're interested in this topic of using R for social science research and social science teaching, it's a, a book called Quantitative Social Science from uh, the author uh, Kuseke Imei, I-M-A-I. Um, Professor Imei uh, has made his data files and script files widely available. Uh, and uh, the, the book itself has an excellent breakdown line by line of, uh, of the R script, but also provides the grounding in the theoretical methods and the research methods. Uh, so highly recommend QSS, Quantitative Social Science, um, in case you wanna learn more about this. There's also a version for Stata as well. Okay, so here we see some green text. Um, does anyone want to chime in on the chat? What is what does the green text mean? When you see green text in an R script, what do you think that means? I'll give you a hint. It usually starts with a hashtag. So, uh, what's the green text mean in the script? Yes, Talisha, that's right. It's the comment. Um, basically, when you start any line in an R script with a hashtag, uh, R is not going to run, interpret that as a line of code. Rather, it's going to be what's called a comment. And uh, if you've ever programmed before, you know that it's important to comment your code. <laughs> uh, and that's the way you provide comments. Basically, you tell the the reader what each line does. And, um, and so very uh, useful uh, thing to use in R and other programming languages. Um, in other languages, it might be an asterisk. Uh, you know, there's various conventions, but in R it's hashtag. So hashtag means comment. Okay, let's begin by loading our file, but I'm gonna break down this line of code here. And so I'm on line 11. And I, I acknowledge that not everyone has multiple screens. So I'll try to be very mindful of saying which line of the script I'm on. Uh, right now I'm looking at line 11. Um, and if I'm going too fast, just please uh, chime in in the chat. I'll, I've got that up as well. And uh, I can slow things down or repeat anything. Um, so on line 11, we see uh, a line of code. Uh, Resume is the first thing that you see there. And that's actually something that we define. That's, that's called a data frame. Um, and what resume is going to do is it's going to have the contents of the CSV file, the data file that we've already uploaded. And the way we bring the contents of CSV into this data frame, into this data file that we're creating, is using this function read.csv. Uh, if you had a text file, uh, you could use read.txt. There are a variety of ways to bring files into R. This is one approach. We know it's a CSV file, so we can use this function read.csv. And then every function in R has one or more arguments. So uh, here we see two arguments. They're divided by a comma. First one is file.choose and then an open and close parentheses. And what that's going to do is it's going to give you a navigator. So it'll, you know, once we run this line of code, you'll actually see an option to choose which file. Choose, that's hence file.choose. You choose which file you want to bring into the data frame. And the second argument in this function is header equals true. Uh, and essentially what that's doing is it's saying, okay, R, read the first line in as the variable names, uh, not as the data itself. So if header equals true, that means R knows, okay, so that first line of this CSV file are gonna be variable names. Um, so uh, <laughs> thanks, Mike. Uh, yes, I love file.choose. In fact, it's one of my frustrations with Python is that I don't believe Python has and then now, and I'm not an expert in Python, but I haven't found a version of file.choose in Python yet. Uh, if anyone knows of one, uh, feel free to chime in, but I love file.choose. 
Uh, and then very important, uh, this arrow operator. So um, in R, it is possible to use equals, but I'm highly gonna rec strongly recommend using this arrow operator. Uh, essentially what it does is it says, okay, take this function and the results of this function on the right side and put that into whatever's on the left. Um, Kelly, yes, uh, file.choose is base R, yes. Um, so let's go ahead and, and run this line of code. So if your cursor is on line 11, all you have to do is click run. You can also uh, use, I believe, command return uh, to do the same thing if you're on a Mac, um, but we'll go ahead and click run. And you'll see the, the choose file appear. And so let's go ahead and choose the data file, resume.csv. Okay, and when we do that, we now have our first entry in the global environment, the top right. Uh, it tells you the dimensions of this data frame. Uh, often in our data set and data frame are interchangeable, um, but we have four columns and 48, 70 rows of this data frame. If you wanted to confirm that, you can use a command called uh, DIM for dimensions of the data frame. And instead of running this line 14, we're gonna also just, we're gonna type it into the console just so you have some experience typing things in to the console. That's good practice as well. So I'm gonna click into the console. This is the bottom left window. And I'm just gonna type in DIM and then the name of the data frame resume. And you'll see the same thing up here. So 4,870 rows in this data data frame or data set in four columns. So one of the first things that I do with any kind of data set or data frame when I first brought it in is I'd like to see the first few rows of the data set. Uh, and you can do that using the head command. Uh, and it defaults to the first six rows of the data set. So let's do that. Let's take a look at the first six rows of this data set. So I'm going to use the function head. And again, I'm gonna type this into the console and the data frame resume. And here we see across the top, the variable names, that's gonna be important in just a moment. So we have four variables, first name, sex, race, and call. And that call variable uh, refers to whether or not the applicant received the callback from the potential employer. So that's what call is. Zero means they did not, one means that they did. Um, now that's just the first six lines, but you can use the head command and get say the first 20 lines by adding a second argument. So the head function, you can use one argument just to get six, or you can say comma and then add whatever number you'd like to get a much larger number of um, the first rows of, uh, of any data frame. Uh, tail does the same thing, except on the last six rows. So if I type in tail resume, then I get the last six rows of this data set. Why is that helpful? Why do you think it would be useful to do head or tail Go ahead and type it into the chat. What's what's the value of looking at the first few rows or looking at the last few rows of, of any data frame? Um, you're welcome to chime in on chat or to uh, open up your mic. Kelly, to understand the structure of your data. Yeah. Yes, Talisha, uh, making sure you've got the right data set uh, to get a sense of the range. Very good, Kelly Ann. You know, um, Yep, Courtney, absolutely. You see what variables you're working with uh, and you see what the names are. Again, that's gonna be uh, crucial here in just a moment. I'll also point out, you can, you can also see sometimes anomalies. Uh, for example, if you work with the general social survey, which is a very common social science data set, especially for doing work in intersectionality, um, the way variables are coded may change. 
from data set to data set. So here we have a very clean data set. You know, sex is um, female or male, uh, acknowledging that that is 2004, and I um, we've moved uh, past that initial. Uh, uh, I think you know very broad way of understanding gender, um, but it's one or the other for the purposes of this data set. Um, same thing with race, which is kind of the key part of this analysis. It's either black or white. Um, and again, uh, you'll hear this kind of refrain of this paper and this data set uh, don't reflect the multidimensionality of individual characteristics. My hope is that we get there. And certainly the more recent social science research focused on gender and um, and ethnic origin and you know, race are transcending the either or dynamic that uh, this paper uh, reflects. So, um, but for the purpose of our kind of initial foray here, uh, black or white, and then callback or not, zero or one. And you also see that, that these are uh, different types of variables. So callback is uh, either zero or one. It's a numeric variable, which is great for math, doing math. It's very easy to do math on numeric variables. Much more challenging to do that with variables that are strings or characters. Um, but we will find a way to change those in just a moment. So, uh, so summary command uh, is what we're going to look at next. But remember, head and tail can be very helpful as well. So now let's look at this summary command. So I'm just going to type in the word summary, this is on line 20, to look at the summary statistics of this data set. So what we see here is the number of rows. This is called length for each variable. Um, and importantly, we also see the average uh, or the mean for the callback rate. So if we convert this mean to percentage, we see that the callback rate is 8.8. 8.0%, almost 8.1%. So that what that means is in this data set of almost 5,000 applicants, there were on average, irrespective of race or sex, 8% got callbacks. So we're gonna now dive into that number a little bit more. First thing we're gonna do is to create what's called a, a contingency table. Sometimes it's called a cross tab. You can also refer to this as a two-way cross tab using the table command. Uh, this is part of base R as well. So this is on line 28. You'll see there's our, our friend, the arrow operator. Uh, again, the recommendation is to continue using this arrow operator instead of the equal sign, because there are some older packages in R that um, use equals in different ways. So arrow operator always works. Um, and what arrow operator is gonna do is it's gonna take what's on the right side this function on the right side and put it into a table on the left that we're gonna call race.call.tab or two-way contingency table, two-way cross tab uh, that includes the race of the applicant and whether or not they got a callback. So those are the two arguments that the table command is using here. Now, the first one is, using race dollar sign, I'm sorry, resume dollar sign race. That dollar sign is also important. So we've seen some very important kind of foundational pieces of R here. The first one is the arrow operator. Um, the second one here that you wanna remember is whenever you see dollar sign, you're, it's referencing a one variable within this resume data frame. That's how you select a variable in R is using this dollar sign. So, and within resume, we know that one of the variables is called race. Um, we can use this, we can call this anything we want. Um, just for ease of an interpretation, we're gonna use the same variable name. And same thing here. So we're gonna look at race and callback rate using the table command. So I'm gonna go ahead and run line 28. So I'll just put my cursor on 28 and then click run. And you don't see anything appear in the bottom 
left in your console window, but you do see a new entry appear in the global environment in the top right. Um, so if we wanted to see the results of this two-way crosstab in the console, you can just type in race.call.tab, which we've created. Um, and you'll, you'll also notice as you type, because we've created this, this new uh, object, this new table, R recognizes that and will help you autocomplete. So then you can just press tab to autocomplete. So now I'll just type enter and I see the two-way table here. Next thing we're gonna do is on line 32, we're gonna add the totals. The function is called add margins. And essentially what it's gonna do is it's gonna add up the totals for each row for the uh, black and white uh, applicants. Remember their perceived race by the employer, prospective employer. Uh, that's the, the field experiment here. So I'm gonna click on 32 and click run. And now we see the totals. That's the add margins command. Okay, so now let's dive into the data a little bit more. Um, on line 38, we're gonna use a function called sum, which is an arithmetic fun functions, just adding up. Uh, in this case, it's going to be adding up the uh, total number of callbacks by the total sample size. So, a uh, great question, Talisha. We did not add a new column to the table. Um, it's only visible in the console. That's a very good question. Uh, and the reason why is the race.call.tab, that table, uh, we didn't use the arrow operator to add those margins into the, the new table. It's simply um, just uh, showing us what's, what's on the console here. Now, the way to confirm that is to call that race.call.tab again, and you'll see that the margins aren't included. The sum uh, total is not included there. So that's a very good, good question. Okay, so on line 38, we are um, gonna add up uh, the second element in this table. So this is a little tricky and this is where um, R does become a lot more uh, nuanced. We have our table, race.call.tab, and then we see these square brackets. These square brackets mean that we are indexing that table. Uh, and R is a one indexed programming language, which means the first element in any object, whether it's a data frame or in this case, a table is one. And the second object, the second element is two and so on. That's important to note because in Python, it, Python is a zero indexed programming language. So the first element in any kind of Python uh, data frame uh, or list is zero. So that's one big difference between R and Python. Um, R, remember R is a one indexed programming language. The other thing I wanna note here is whenever you see these square brackets, um, it's indexing whatever you're looking at in terms of rows and then columns. So this first empty space here, there's no, nothing included there is just a comma. That means that we're looking at all of the rows in this table. There are only two rows, but we're looking at all of them. But for the columns, we're only looking at the second column. And the second column is uh, whether or not, is, is the callback, a uh, positive callback, a one. So that means 157 and 235. So that's what we're looking at it. We're getting both 157 and 235 because we're looking at the second element in this table. Then we're dividing that by the total number of rows in the entire data set. That's n row, that's the function. And what that's gonna give us is a number that we already know. It's the total callbacks divided by the sample size, which is, as we recall, 8%. But now we can start to divide that callback rate by group. 
So how do we do that? There, one thing I'll also note is in the script, showing you how to do multiple, uh, giving you multiple paths to accomplish the same task. Uh, that can be both confusing, and, but also liberating because you'll recognize there are more efficient ways to get at each data point. Uh, this is gonna become really important once we start diving into the intersections between race and gender, uh, race and sex in this data set. Okay, so we're on line 41 here and we're looking at the table and we've got the square bracket. So we know we're indexing that, that data object, that's this table. And we're looking at the first row. And you'll recall that the first row refer to the, uh, the perceived black applicants. And the second element or the second um, kind of item in this uh, square bracket refers to the columns and we're looking at the callbacks. It's the second column in this data frame, 157. And then we're dividing by the total number of black applicants. So this is, this is why we're looking at one, but then the column is empty. That means we're looking at all columns here. Uh, or both columns in this case, zero and one, to get the total number of uh, applicants that are perceived as African-American. That's 2278 plus 157. So we're adding that up because we wanna get the callback rate for each group. So that's, this is line 41. And we get 6.4%. Uh, so now immediately we see, uh, you know, there's a variation there. Uh, our variance between the total callback rate uh, and the callback rate for perceived black applicants. This is a very important point regarding this paper and this experiment. The only thing that was changed here were the first names. I think that's the crucial um, point that Bertrand and Molly Nathan are making is the content of the resumes is exactly the same. It's the first name that was manipulated uh, and uh, I think that's where there's, they're making a, a claim of causal inference here, that it's not necessarily related to this disparity isn't related, can't be attributed to other things uh, that they're, they're really focused on perceived race. Okay, so let's go ahead and also run the white applicants. So this is row number two and column number two in this table. So this is 235. Those white sounding names that received callbacks. And importantly, we're adding up the, the second row here. That's why that's a two, but both the zeros and ones, those that got a callback and those that didn't, um, that's why this second element in this square bracket is blank. We're getting both columns. We'll click run here. And we see that it's 9.65, 9.7%. So there's the disparity there. Uh, acknowledging once again, that the content of the resume is exactly the same. Okay, so uh, hopefully you're getting a little more proficient with some of this, you know, the square bracket concept, the, use of the dollar sign operator to get to a variable name, the use of the arrow operator to assign what's on the right side to something that we define on the left. Um, line 52 is just, again, driving home the point of what, how this square bracket works. Um, so, and if, you know, if you're, if you wanna explore on your own, you can also just, use the table command and say, I wanna look at just one element in this table, just looking at white applicants that received a callback. That's what this is doing here. Second row, second column. As I mentioned, there are multiple ways to do the same thing in R. It's one of the great uh, powers of this language, uh, that really any programming language, but especially R. Um, so we can do the same thing using the data frame and then the dollar sign uh, to get the average callbacks. So on line 65, I get the average callback 8%. So now let's, 
say we want to get the callback rate for each um, perceived race. Uh, we've done that in a brute force approach using the square bracket, but we can do this using the subset command. And here's where um, by using the subset command, you're able to now start to investigate intersectionality uh, in this data set. So on line 72, we take the average, the mean of the callback rate. So there we're using the data frame, that dollar sign, which should look familiar to you now, just looking at the callback rate. But importantly, we're using the square brackets here and we want to only isolate the callback rates for those uh, applicants who are perceived as African-American. So that's the resume data frame dollar sign race. I need to use two equals here because we're looking at for an exact match. And this is where using the head command to investigate the data a little bit is really important because if there are misspellings or if there are variations that the data generating process used, uh, this could create uh, an issue when you're doing your analysis. So, but you know, for the purpose of this, we know that it's a clean data set and uh, there, there are no misspellings. So what we want to do here is we're going to um, index just the call variable with only those black sounding names and then looking at the average. Um, so I'm going to run line 72 and we see that it's 6.4%, which is the same as what we did earlier using the brute force approach. Um, can do the same thing here. And I actually made a mistake here. Let's see if you can catch it on line 77. Uh, if we want to compute the callback rate for white sounding names, and I accidentally put black there, I'm going to change that to white. And we see that it's 9.7%. And then to compute the difference uh, between the two, you would simply, uh, you can try do it, you know, just using some math here, um, 0.09 minus 0.06, you get your answer. There's a 3.2% difference, uh, but you could also do that using the code and um, just have this minus this uh, or reverse that. 77 minus 72. So type this out minus what's on line 72 and you get the same thing. Okay, let's uh, scroll down a little bit more. Um, and we're gonna gloss over a bit what's going on here, but essentially what we're, we're doing is we wanna start to look at um, how to convert what's currently characters, strings, text into something that we can analyze quantitatively and that's the race variable so on on line 87 um, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the perceived race of the first five observations so there's that dollar sign we know we're looking at the race variable and the square bracket is going to look at is going to allow you to display the first five observations uh first five rows of that variable so we see that these are the first five rows of that variable. And what's going on on line 90 is may seem a little strange, um, but what we're doing is we're creating a logical operator. Um, we're, we're saying, okay, uh, are the, for the first five observations in this data frame, which are black and which are white? Well, we do this using true false operators. And it's just saying, okay, uh, for the first five observations, which ones are um, listed as black? And we see that the third and the fourth rows include uh, that string. The others do not. Um, this is kind of a stepping stone to what we're going to be doing next, which is uh, 
turning all of these into factors, factor variables. But we'll have to do a little bit of work before we get there. So on line 95, uh, what we're going to do here is we're going to start to subset uh, our data frame, which we currently only have one data frame. We've been relying on this resume data frame of all 4870 rows uh, for the entirety of the script. But now we want to start to subset to analyze the intersections between race and gender or race and sex. So we're going to do this by using the resume data frame. There's the square bracket, so we know we're indexing uh, this data this data frame. Uh, we're looking at only those that are those perceived African American sounding names. Uh, that's indicated by black in the race variable. Uh, those we're taking all of those rows. I'm sorry. We're just taking the the rows where uh, the perceived applicant is African American, uh, and then we're using all of the columns. So the sex, whether or not they got a callback rate, and also the name are all going to be included in this new data frame called resume B. So when I click run here, we now see there's a new entry in our global environment. There's now one with 2,435 observations, but all their four variables. Uh, we're subsetting um, the, data, the data set. We still have our original data set, but now we have one that's only the black names. Uh, 96 and 97 should look familiar to you. This is where you can get dimensions of the data set. We can also look at the global environment here, and you can get the average callback rate for just the black sounding names, which we've already done several times. Um, if you're curious, it is correct. So 6.4%, just as we got before. Um, and now, you know, I'd, I'd encourage you uh, as you go through the script on your own to to try to do this using the white sounding names as well, but we'll we'll do that in just a moment. Okay, so uh, we're, we've done this in a variety of ways. You can use a the function, the subset function, when you want to capture the intersections. So we're using this subset function. The first argument in this subset function is the data frame, the original data frame, and then we're selecting some columns. So we're going to select whether or not they get a callback, uh, their first name, but we're subsetting on uh, the race and on the sex of the applicants. And remember they're strings, so that's why you have to use two equal signs here. So that's the second argument. It's the, this is a nested subset <laughs> and it can get confusing. And so, um, you know, in the spirit of learning how to do things multiple ways, we'll go ahead and highlight both lines here. And we're going to call this resume uh, BF for black female. And now we've got uh, 1,886 observations, and we're only looking at callback rate and first name. So that's why there are only two variables there. Um, now, what's the alternative syntax here? Well, uh, on line 111, you can see that we can, we can uh, instead of using the subset command, we can also do this using just um, kind of standard R indexing the resume data frame. Within that data frame, we've got the race variable equals uh, the string black, and there's the and operator there, sex, female, and then the second, uh, item or second argument it refers to the columns and we're selecting two columns does the exact same thing as what we did on line 106 um, so i'm going to click run on 111 and we see the same result here we can do the same thing with the black males in this data set using the subset command the data frame is the first argument the second argument is subsetting on race and on sex and creating a new data frame called resume bm now it's really important that you have a naming convention that makes sense to you um, but it's also crucial here that we comment our code so that when you come back to this a year later or three years later you know what's happening and what you're doing at each step so this is line 116 do the same thing with white females again this 
subset command, the data frames, the first argument, and then essentially the subset that you want to perform on this data frame as the second argument. And I click run. Same thing with white males. And so now you can look at the uh, the gaps based on race or perceived race in this data set. Um, among white females and black females, you would use the average command mean or callback rate. Because remember, that is one of the variables that we've included here. Uh, you'll also notice that I didn't um, just limit to callback and first name. These are including uh, all of the four variables. Uh, so line 125, we see that among females in this data set, there is a racial gap of 3.3% between white females and black females, or remember perceived white females and perceived black females. And among males, a gap of 3%. Um, so now what we can do is we can also turn all of this into a matrix essentially of ones and zeros. Uh, when you're doing quantitative analysis, that can be very helpful. On line 132, we can do that using the if else command. So I'll break down this line of code for you. Um, the if else function says, okay, if the uh, element in question is true, give it a one, otherwise give it a zero. So if in the resume data frame we have uh, a string that's black and female, we'll give that element a one, I'll assign it a one, a numeric, otherwise it will be a zero. Um, and so, and we'll create a column here. That's what we're doing here. We're putting the results using the arrow operator into a new column that we're calling black female. And because there's not already a variable called black female in resume, what you'll see is you'll see that the number of variables increment up in our global environment. Remember, this is the global environment. So I'll show you what's going on here. I'll click run on line 132. And now we see there are five variables because now there's a fifth column called black female with ones and zeros. And that makes it easier to do statistical analysis uh, at the intersection of race and gender. We can do now do a three-way table based on race, sex, and uh, black females uh, in this data set. So just to kind of confirm our results. So let's turn everything into a factor. And what this does is it makes it a lot easier in a more efficient way to do this type of analysis uh, at, at intersections. And that's because we're converting these strings into factors. Um, so the first thing we do is on line 137, we're creating a column that is going to have, it's going to be empty essentially called type. And that's, these are just NAs for now. So that's on line 137. So now you see six variables. Um, but our next step on line 138 and through line 141 is we are going to, in that type, we're going to say, okay, if uh, race is black and sex is female in the resume data frame, we're gonna assign that a factor black female. And we'll do that same thing for each one of these intersections. So I'm gonna highlight 138 through 141. And so now that sixth variable is no longer gonna be NA. It's gonna be populated with all of the intersections between the sex and the perceived sex and the perceived race of each applicant. Well, uh, Kelly, great question. We're about to uh, to do that co conversion to factor in just a moment. Um, and I may have misspoken. Uh, what this is doing is it's actually, these are strings, uh, still strings, but what we need to do is turn them into factors. So we're just about to do that in the next uh, few lines. Um, so. Uh, Kelly asks a great question. How do you know what this is? And there's a command in R called class. Uh, so this is line 144 class. And we've got this sixth variable that we've created called type. We wanna see what those are. 
Turns out they are strings, they're characters. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna coerce that character variable into a factor variable. Uh, and we do that using this as.factor function. It's part of base R. Um, we do as.factor on type. So we're gonna convert each one of those four intersections into a factor. Uh, and I'll run line 146 to do that. And so now we can say, okay, uh, let's look at all of the levels of the, the factor. And we use that levels command here on 148 to do that. And we see, okay, in that sixth column, we have four intersections uh, listed. So now you can, as factors, it's much easier to do cross tabulation, uh, to do other types of quantitative analysis for that, that type. Uh, so let's look at a table of all of the intersections here. Um, um, all right, hang on for one second. Okay. Um, Talisha asks great question. Let's let's rewind to what is a factor. <laughs> Uh, and there is some of this jargon in R that's so sometimes vexing to even for me to navigate. Um, best way to think of a factor is a category. Um, it's another way to define a categorical variable that has a limited number of levels um, or distinct values. Uh, so I think categories is the best way to describe what, what's going on here. Um, R uses factor. There's this kind of derisive term in, in R, R speak, <laughs> but it's a real thing. Uh, and it, uh, it is like learning another language, you know? Um, and uh, I think once you um, do more coding and get into uh, something I do a lot is I look at other scripts and I look at the comments and um, kind of parse it then you start to learn the, the, the R speak, but uh, I hope it gets better over time. It, some of it is a little bit frustrating to teach, um, you know, factors versus categories, for example, uh, but I'm glad you asked that question. It's a good one. Okay, uh, next thing we're gonna do is uh, we are gonna try to, um, uh, For one second, I'm just going to make sure I'm in the right spot. We're going to calculate the callback rate for each of the four categories. So now we're really diving into the intersection, um, the analysis here. Uh, so the first way we do that is uh, using the t apply function. Um, and you could do this a variety of ways. You could compute this one by one as we've done earlier. But this is a very efficient way to use factors or use the fact that we've created these categories now in the type field uh, uh, to use this function using this category, this factor that we have now available to us. So uh, T apply has three arguments here. Uh, it's basically saying, okay, um, what's the function that you want to apply uh, to which categories and in, in which ways. Uh, so we want to apply a mean function to the type categories. These are the categories uh, based on their callback rate. That's what this T apply is doing. So I'm gonna run this line 159. And we see that the callback rates are listed here. Um, now we could write another piece of code to get just the variances from average um, based on this data. So the last thing we wanna do is, let's say we wanna look at the callback rate um, based on first name because that was kind of one of the, that was the, the key uh, 
piece of this experiment was changing the first name. Uh, so now we can turn each one of those names into a factor variable. And we're gonna do that. We already have the first names in our data set, but we, we're gonna coerce using this as.factor command. And just a side note, this is a very powerful, this as dot function in R is, is really quite powerful because you can coerce virtually anything into something else. Um, and, you know, it comes with a lot of caveats and it can create more problems than solve them uh, sometimes, but it's, it's, a, it's a powerful tool in the R toolkit. So we're gonna create factors of each of the first names uh, in line 165. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna use that T apply function to then take the average uh, based on the first name factors callback rate. So it's very similar to what we did a little bit earlier uh, across all of the intersections, but this time we're looking at just first names. And we're gonna create a new uh, data frame with just the names, callback rates based on name. We're calling it callback.name. You can call it anything you'd like though. Um, this is on line 168. And so now what we're gonna do uh, is sort by, by callbacks uh, and names and we're using the sorting command. We've got that data frame and we wanna look at this in increasing order using the sort function. And we see that uh, this is the callback rate based on first name, uh, perceived race. Um, uh, but this, this last piece is just showing the first name, which the, the authors of the paper uh, also included in their findings. So this has been, you know, we've tried to cover a lot of territory here. We've tried to take a fairly complex sociological concept and apply it to a, an important paper within economics uh, for people that have never used a programming language. I will acknowledge that might be trying to do too much, but the hope is that um, using some of these simpler tools like table and summary, uh, and some of these arithmetic operations, you get more familiar and you see the possibility. I think, uh, who was it, Talisha brought up a really good point earlier saying, we contain multitudes. We're only looking at a very simple intersection here, but this could certainly expand into other intersections given the right data set. So the goal here is just to kind of inspire you to take the mantle and, and um, uh, yeah, uh, I think that's one of the uh, the important points that Bertrand and Mola Nathan brought up, uh, Kelly, is that the argument at that time, and some of this still persists, that there may be other factors that account for uh, the disparities in hiring. Um, they're saying, no, it's really discrimination that persists within American society. And this leads to what I hope is a more fruitful discussion of unconscious bias training, for example, to try to move towards a more equitable, uh, more equitable, um, you know, place or within American society broadly, but uh, in this case within the labor market. Uh, so, uh, before we we begin to um, you know discuss this any further. Any questions about the script? Anything that was confusing? Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy to try to unpack anything a little bit further. Um, there, at a previous workshop, there was a question about whether or not the authors needed to go through IRB because they're, they're doing a field experiment with real you know, employers here, but using fake data. And they did go through IRB and they acknowledge, um, you know, this potential to crowd out applicants uh, in in the uh, the real world. Uh, so, um, so I'm going to read through the the chats. There are several coming in here. Yeah, uh, Talisha, I found that to to be a good way to teach. Um, my preference is having people type in the in the commands. Sometimes, if you get a a line of code that's kind of lengthy, 
there's a misspelling and that slows everything down. So, you know, when it's simple commands, we type them out. When they're more complex, we just use the run command in the script. Um, uh, Sele, that's an excellent uh, suggestion to turn this into something more visual. Um, I think perhaps creating a slide deck intro that's very visual and maybe even using like Venn diagrams could be a way to ground it a little bit more. But um, yeah, I'm all ears about, um, about how to proceed to make this a little more accessible for those that are new to data. Uh, Chris, uh, IRB Institutional Review Board, every researcher in the United States working at a research university and probably federal agencies as well has to go through um, a training and an approval process whenever working with human subjects or whenever there's a potential for um, real people to, to be de-anonymized. Um, that's, uh, you know, where there's any kind of threat to autonomy that requires um, IRB approval. Yeah, ethics review. Uh, when could we access the recording? Uh, Emma, I'm gonna leave that up to the, uh, maybe Mike or others who might know how to answer that. Uh, Matt, that came up, a great question about uh, using tidyverse versus base R. Um, I, my thoughts are that tidyverse is likely a better approach. Uh, the quantitative social science book does, does not use tidyverse, um, you know, for better or worse, I suppose. So I'm kind of reproducing what, what uh, Ime did in QSS. I've done other workshops using tidy I find it to be more intuitive. Um, the tidy package, depending on how much computing power you have, some, can sometimes take a while to install. Um, and there's probably, um, I'm not a computer scientist, but I imagine some CS folks find it productive for new learners to learn base functions and then to recognize the value of using packages. A non-answer for your very good question, <laughs> Matt. I'm open to what you think as well. I know that we're we're having a good, uh, vibrant chat, uh, but if anyone wants to open up your mic, please, by all means. And uh, Mike, this might be a good time to turn off the recording. I think we've um, exhausted the the R component here.